this week on the Full Time Flippers Reselling Podcast. For book, wow. 80 bucks for a book. Uh, but yeah, definitely, you know, if you see if you see Stephen King, definitely pick it up and open it up and look for the first edition. Hi, I'm Chad the Quirky Picker. I'm a full-time reseller from Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Hi everyone, I'm Dennis the Free King Flipper. I'm a full-time reseller from Cape Cod, Massachusetts. Join us each week as we discuss life as a full-time reseller. We will share our experiences, both the good and the not so good. Learn from our expertise and our mistakes. From sourcing to listing to shipping, customer interactions, we will cover it all. This is the Full-Time Flippers Reselling Podcast. Welcome to the Full-Time Flippers Reselling Podcast. I'm Chad the Quirky Picker and I'm here with my co-host. I'm Dennis the Freaking Flipper. What's up? Hey, Dennis. Well, I'll tell you what's up. My audio is having issues the last three or four podcasts. I don't know if you've, when you've listened to it clips and stuff, I've been troubleshooting, trying to figure out what, what the problem is with my audio. Um, I thought maybe it has something to do with my son being on the internet and stealing some of my bandwidth away. But uh, if you've been listening and noticed there's an audio issue, we're, we're aware of it. I'm trying to fix it. Uh, I've been running some tests and hopefully I can get that figured out here sooner, sooner than later. How was your week, Dennis? What'd you do this week? It was um, another one of those roller coaster weeks, you know, uh, really good day, terrible day, really good day, terrible, like no, no straight line at all. Mm -hmm. You know, the little bar graph that you can look on like eBay and stuff. Um, I had um, no Poshmark, well, one Poshmark sale. I had... Um, no local sales, no Facebook marketplace, something like that. So unfortunately I had to just stay right with eBay and mess around with the algorithm and do my end and sell similar. And it's Friday or we're recording now on a Friday, but I haven't rich reached my goal yet. So that means I am having to have a very good weekend to salvage the week. So other than that, and then my, truck um battery was going out and um 258 dollars later it's man i don't remember buying them no yeah i don't remember them being that expensive but it's one of those things you're, what are you gonna do you know yeah. you're gonna you're gonna get stranded it's, it's just gonna die so it was kind of struggling in the morning to start and i'm like yeah it's it's time to to replace that so yeah, I always in my mind a car battery should cost like 129 bat 129 dollars or so. And <laughs> I'm like, I guess we're not living in the 1990s anymore. I had a very interesting week. Not at all what I thought I was going to be doing this week. Um, I had jury duty. I I got called like a year ago. I had jury duty. I got selected. Well, and I was supposed to call in like at 6 p.m. the night before just to see if I had to report or not. And the last time I didn't have to report, so I called in at six o'clock uh last sunday night and i did have to report so i showed up with like probably 150 other people total i don't know how many juries they selected total for for cases but it was criminal case criminal court week so they they took like uh 40 people uh the first 40 people that were there numerically um went to a courtroom and i never saw them again so then i was in the second group and we we got a court we went into a courtroom and i was sitting towards the front and I'm like, there might be a chance I'm actually going to be on a jury. Uh, and so they ask us a whole bunch of questions. You know, are, do we have any police offices in, in our family or our close friends or anything like that? And would we be biased? And, you know, all the typical questions. But I didn't have any and uh, I didn't have any reason not to be there. Uh, and so uh, I ended up getting selected onto a jury. I was one of 12, you know, juries are always 12. And um, we heard a criminal case about some... Uh, fraud as far as um a guy was accused of making a fake id for for someone who was an illegal immigrant and uh helped him get a registration for a car and we had to decide if oh. the guy did it or not was he was he responsible and did he got did he forge the guy's name on some documents and there was you know it was a little more elaborate than that but it was two days so we we finished up testimonies on the second day then we deliberated and I won't see him. That's, I don't want to really talk about it too much more than that. But um, yeah. it, I ended up being the foreman of the jury. 
uh, only because I was like the comic relief, I think, during the breaks and stuff. I, most people were just <laughs> not talking. And I, I'm like, I always tried to start up conversations with people. Um, so when they ask who wanted to be the foreman, every single person looked at me and I'm like, I'll do it. And I, the main reason was because this was one of my lifelong bucket list. I have always wanted to serve on a jury and be the foreman of a jury. I don't even like public speaking. I don't, I don't like public speaking. I don't like attention, yeah. but I just, I've listened to true crime podcasts for, you know, over 10 years and I've heard all sorts of jury situations how innocent people get convicted how guilty people walk free and how juries are manipulated you know or just what we what we hear and what we don't hear and there's always stuff going on behind the scenes of a in a court that you know handcuff both both lawyer both the lawyer and even the the dis district attorney so i i was on jury duty i got got to cross it off my bucket list and um i was glad i did it but when you're self-employed and you're a reseller, nobody's paying your paying for you to be off of work. I was so just going to ask you that. Yeah, it's, it's all out of my pocket. That's a lot of a lot of time, you know, that you were not sourcing and listing and and all of that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that was only two days. the The trial in that courtroom before us, we were told lasted two weeks. Uh, I don't know. I don't know what I would have done. How can you go there all uh, day long and still fulfill orders? Because I don't work out of my basement. So I have to drive to another location to my warehouse to take care of everything. So I would have just been like getting home at four or five in the evening and then having to drive and pack for two to three hours every night. And I, I would do it again. Probably I'd prefer if my employer would pay me, but <laughs> uh, I'm my own employer. So I had to just figure out ways to deal with it. So moving on to viewer mail, um, we had a comment from one of a viewer, Dan in demand. He's on YouTube. Uh, in regards to our question last week of, have you ever been snarky with a customer? And Dan said, I was just snarky this weekend. I had an eBay user ask me the absolute lowest that I, that you'll go for an item. And I took the word absolute lowest literally. And I said, yeah, one time I pushed my nephew down just to get an Easter egg. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you know obviously the buyer was asking about the price but dan you know right. refers to his low character what he would how low he would go to get an item absolute so, lowest uh, so that's good pushes pushes nephew down for an easter egg so dan's a pretty <laughs> funny guy if you've ever seen his channel um and he's on the uh well they have a, the leftovers podcast they used to be the pocket change podcast but they just changed their name so um, and speaking of podcasts, we had an, we were shouted out by another podcast um, a few weeks ago. So I wanted to play a clip from that. It's from um, Corey and Ken from um, the Reseller Clickbait podcast. And uh, here's what they had to say. When I said that earlier, speaking of podcasts, um, I owe, I owe, like, I really butchered. There is a new podcast uh, out there, there that is. just started this week and last week i i butchered the name and i didn't know anything about it but i watched the first episode it is called the full-time flippers podcast okay and uh a uh, friend of mine chad quirky picker uh and his uh co-host is dennis the free king flipper and so go. they had their they had their first episode out um i'll have to go watch it Last week, I, I think it's going to come out on on Monday mornings and stuff. And so they're they're jumping into the podcast arena, if you will. Well, they're like spinning that one up just in time because this one's kind of going down in flames the way we're going today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so, thank you, guys. Yeah, yeah, we appreciate any feedback. I guess if they we're open to criticism too. So, but everybody seems to be liking our podcast so far. So hopefully, you know, nobody's too mean to us. Moving on to home runs and strikeouts, uh, the best and worst sales of the week. Uh, what do you got, Dennis? Okay, so my home run this week, I think I this was one of my bolos actually a couple of weeks ago. Do you remember the Def Leppard box set? Mm -hmm. It was like uh, CDs, a DVD, like booklets and all kinds of stuff. Uh, I finally sold it this week for a price of $149.99 plus shipping. Yeah. Uh, was that, that was $5? At a, it was $5. $5. Yeah. So mm. that was a great surprise. It was probably my 
my yeah, it was it was my home run of the week, my best mm-hmm. sale of the week by far, and um, it's already shipped out, and uh, hopefully it'll get there by Monday, I would say. But my uh, home run was again. I, I said this last week, and I'm still saying it this week that I'm not selling a lot of high dollar items. Um, my this was my biggest sale. It tied my biggest sale, but um, it was a whole a Harley Davidson motorcycle passenger seat. I guess you attach it to the back cool. of a Harley Davidson motorcycle. I paid five dollars at a yard sale last summer, and it sold for sixty five dollars. The only problem is I didn't know which model of Harley it actually came from. So I'm just hoping that the person that bought it said they looked closely at the pictures and what my dimensions were, and they think it'll fit what they have. And I said, buy it. And if it doesn't fit, send it back. Because I've, I've had this yeah. thing almost a year. And this is the first person that's really been interested. I sold one last year. And if you flip it upside down, it's almost like a manufacturer's mark mm-hmm. that's kind of like uh, embedded in the plastic underneath. Yeah. It yeah. Should. So it might be a, a serial number. It'll say Harley Davidson. So mm-hmm. you know it's a legit piece yeah. but it'll have a serial number and i think you can um search that and it'll give you the the model but i think those were in the photos i think i took you know okay. I, I always any model number definitely goes in a photo yeah so I'm, I'm hoping that he did his research search because right i couldn't i didn't know what to tell him other than if it doesn't fit send it back nice um and what was your strikeout this week my strikeout was and i love buying these and selling them um, it's one of those often overlooked items that you see. It's a globe, like a 12 inch globe. And they're in like a stand, yeah. you know, like a big round wooden stand with feet. And you're supposed to be able to turn it and all that. This was a vintage piece. It was probably from the fifties. Um, and it sold for seventy nine ninety nine. Shipping was horrible. I hate, I hate shipping them, but, uh, it was, it was a free free globe you know 80 bucks later and of course he opens a return says it doesn't spin and <laughs> did it spin did, did you check yeah i mean it yeah. wasn't like one of those ones where you just can whip the thing yeah. around but you can move it around he's not and, spinning uh, it on his finger like a basketball is that no. what he, maybe that's what he's it's supposed to. to have it's supposed to sit in that like cradle stand yeah. you're supposed to be able to turn it he com- he was complaining that it didn't that. so I'm like, I'm not paying the money to have it sent back. I'm, I'm just not doing it. Yeah. So there's your freebie. There's my strikeout. Lesson learned for me. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I probably didn't describe it as good as I probably should have. So that's a strike. Yeah. That's a better story than my strikeout. Uh, you know, like when you have cable running through your house, you have little splitters. And mm-hmm. there's a the one Turk is the name of a company that makes antennas and, and splitters and stuff. And I had a little Turk splitters was just in a box of electronics. And I'm like, Hey, I can take like two pictures of this and uh, list it for like $5 plus shipping. You know, like it's going to take me 10 seconds. This is like probably the easiest thing I've ever listed. So I listed it and a year and a half later, I took an offer finally of $2. So that is the, <laughs> I've never sold anything for $2 before. That's the lowest. And I'm like, okay, it's a dollar, pro- maybe a dollar profit when it's all said and done. Cause they, they paid for shipping. Um, okay. But it took up no space in my store and literally took me less than a minute to probably list and less than a minute to pack. So making, wow. two, making about a dollar a minute there, <laughs> which is $60 an hour. If you add it all up, That's- I could just pack those nonstop. So, but yeah, that is true. Should just get all this low stuff out of my store, but the time's already invested to list it. And a lot of it, when it was listed was, I started like at $15 and right. I just slowly redo every 30 days. When I end and sell similar, I lower the price by 10%. So things are down to like three, $4 now in my store. And I'm like, I could take them out. I don't know if it's hurting my store or not. I mean, there's, I, I guess I've heard different people say different things, but. I've heard that as well. I mean, I'm the same way. I have things from hundreds of dollars down to six, seven dollars, mm-hmm. even four dollars. But I'm like, do I take the time to find it, take it off of the you know the listing, and then go and donate it, or do I just leave it there? 
Yeah. If, if it was I free, normally just leave it there. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It was all free. If someone came up to me and said, I'll just give you $4 for free. I'm not going to say no. Sure. So, but, yeah. but what you were saying there is, does it hurt your store having cheaper items? I don't know. Mm -hmm. I'm not, I'm not sure. Maybe somebody in the comments can tell yeah. us if you're out there. Let and you us have know what you guys have heard. Moving on to bolos and nolos. Uh, one thing to be on the lookout for and one thing you wouldn't buy again. You have a bolo for us. I do. And this was um, last week. I had a couple of really good sales. I brought props. Don't worry. Sit yeah. down. Sit down. We're, we're, we got some great knowledge to share with you folks. Like first edition Stephen King books. Mm. First edition, first printing. I found a pile of these like two weeks ago at a Salvation Army for $1.99 a piece. And I have sold five out of the 12 so far. Um, this morning, I just sold Misery. And that was uh, $24.99. I've also sold uh, Firestarter, Carry, uh, The Stand, Salem's Lot. And those are all ranged from uh, got 25 to 79.99 for a book, wow. 80 bucks for a book. Uh, but yeah, definitely, you know, if you see, if you see Stephen King, definitely pick it up and open it up and look for the first edition. And then, um, you know, it's going to be hard for you guys to see, but this is the page you want to look for. And uh, it'll have one date on it. If it has multiple dates, then you, you, you haven't found what you want. And those are probably worth about $4, four or $5. Uh, another reason to pick these up and look inside, if this is signed by King, now you're not talking about hundreds of dollars. You're talking about potentially a few thousand dollars, depending on what book it is. Um, you know, if you look at do, do a quick search on eBay, there's some signed books in here for four and $5,000. Wow. It is absolutely wild. Uh, oh, I sold The Shining, too. That was a $60 uh, book, $59.99. Another great one is It. If you can find the first edition It, mm -hmm. it's worth um, some serious money. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, people want to see the first edition and first printing, not the eighth printing, the ninth printing. That has a lot to do with the value of it. So this is a great bolo. Um, you know, you book people probably know this already but um you know go to the book section do a quick scan and uh, pick them up check out the uh, date on it check out the edition on it so what is first edition versus second do they actually go through and make corrections or changes so they can change it the 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 front artwork is going to be different and um you know they a second it's edition will be somewhat different especially the artwork the people want what the original artwork looked like when he when he wrote the book okay. you know and then in, oh, this one doesn't have a picture of him in it but there's some goofy pictures <laughs> sorry steven there's some really cool like goofy pictures of him on the on the back cover full beard you know totally creepy and uh i guess people want that because as the editions get you know later and later then uh that's a more modern picture of him in the back so if you want the original, then you go for a first edition. Mm -hmm. If you don't care about it, you just want to read the story, then just get a paperback book for $3 and, and read it. Mm -hmm. I'm a big time travel fan. So my favorite book from King is uh, 11, what is it, 11 about JFK's yeah. assassination. Have you read that one? Yeah. That's one of the I've ones listened... I have not read. Oh, I, I've well, listened like to his... the audio book. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm more into the real old King Mm -hmm. before he had that accident and he kind of got a little soft i like the real nasty dark evil stuff yeah. especially misery and uh pet cemetery stuff like that it's 11 11 2263 i've i've listened to it twice i just love it really i mean i just i love time right. travel so that's why it's on my list i will i will definitely read that one my bolo it's a very interesting bolo because it's 24 karat gold. And um, when I say 24 karat gold, probably everybody's ears have perked up. How can you find 24 karat gold? Well, I was at a yard sale last summer and I found 125 items that were 24 karat gold. 
And this oh. is my prop. It's a blank uh, CDR. And uh, I don't know can you if you can read where it says uh, 24 karat gold somewhere on there. Maybe in the yep. uh, too, right much, there. too much glare. Uh, somehow they put gold into these blank CDRs. I don't know how, but I paid, I bought five cases of them from, from a guy whose brother ran a recording studio and he had, and these were left over in the studio. He had to, he was in charge of the estate, cleared it out and was selling them in a yard sale. I'm getting on average $17 plus shipping per, per disc. And I have sold so far, um, 45 of them for a total of $801. I paid $20, $20 a, for a case of 25. So I paid less than a dollar each. So I've wow. sold 45 of them and I still have 80 more to go. And I've had them wow. not quite a year. So I, I put them up in lots of, um, I sell them in quantities up to five. Like I let the person choose how many they want. As soon as they sell, I just renew the listing, add five more out there, maybe change a photo around. Um, maybe someone else has them now, I, but nobody had them at one time. I was the only person. Yeah. Um, just the, look some up here. Ultra Are disc they C is the brand. CDR? CDR, they, 24 K, 24 karat gold. 24 karat gold CDR. Yeah. Someone's selling a case of 25 for like 65 bucks. A case of 25. Ooh, I just sold five of them for $65 total. Plus shipping. Um, this was uh, March fourteenth. It looks like they sold two cases of them. They're not the same. These are. It's a different brand, I think. Okay, but maybe the brand has something to do with it because these are like recording studio quality. So that's my bowl. I'll be on the lookout for any blank CD that says twenty four karat gold. I'm that's like, I wonder if you could yeah. if you could pull the gold out of it. How much the gold would actually be worth? Like, is is it worth even a dollar's worth of gold? I. Mean, I Real briefly, I actually looked into like the scrap uh, boards, circuit boards, and all that stuff. It is so much work. Yeah. It's a ton of work. Right. It is a chemical it's... process to mm -hmm. get it off. It's not like you're just clipping the thing off. So that that idea fizzled pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. But yeah, <laughs> everyone has to entertain those thoughts. My, my Nolo, um, I, I don't want to beat a dead horse, but I'm going to. Okay. And the reason why is I just got these in that pallet uh, from, what was that, two weeks ago? There you go. Look, I'm rich. I'm going to retire right now. See it? It's a black diamond. No way. Is it sealed? Look at this one. It's the Masterpiece Collection. No, these are opened. Okay. So my NOLO is these opened, the, clam, the clamshell case and all that. Mm. And the, it's... I don't even think they are worth three three dollars, you know. Yeah. Um, don't please don't go out sourcing these thinking that you're gonna be making a ton of money. There's very few titles that are actually worth anything. Mm -hmm. Um specifically, my Nolo is opened, used, Disney, VHS. It's like why like I can't even give them away. I see them all I have the time. A, everywhere. They're yeah. everywhere. They're at every yard sale. They're at every uh, flea market. They're at every thrift store. Um, the title that I still haven't found, though, is the movie Cars. Yep. I heard that was really v rare. Cars on VHS. Get, it did mass produce, right? It was just, just went out to a handful no, of people. No, it, it was one of their last titles that they actually put out on a uh, on a tape. So I'm still so did, on the lookout for that one. Okay. It did go out to the public, though, then, is what you're saying. It yeah. was sold. Okay. All right. My NOLO is hand carved wood animals that originated from like flea markets in other countries. I don't know. If, uh, I was at an estate sale and I saw this really cool hand carved giraffe carving. It had three giraffes on it in like a circle. And I'm like, mm -hmm. oh, this looks pretty cool. It's five bucks. All right. I'll take a chance. I, think it, I just bought it with a bunch of other stuff. Um, but I, I had it in my store over a year. I just sold it this week for $10 plus shipping. So I, you add in fees, I probably made like $3 on it. And, and $10 was probably the most one sold for in the last year. There was, there was a few solds out there, but like $9, $8. So 
So you're talking like just a hand carved an like yeah. wooden animal? Yeah, you go to like a a market to buy a souvenir if you're like in Africa or somewhere and these are okay. like hand carved. Yeah. Or no, no, sometimes just... or you go to Jamaica and you see them and but I'm like, yeah. this is probably made in another country and shipped here and being resold. There's you there's no maker's mark on them, so you don't no. know if, how they're mass produced, where they're made. I think I have one. I got this in uh, Curacao. It's, it looks pretty cool. It's carved, and yeah. it was in those little roadside things, yeah. you know. Is that black Americana? No, I think it's just no. the wood is stained. Okay. Okay. But uh, it was like, I don't know, seven dollars or something like that. Yeah. So I'm like, yeah, that's pretty cool. It's a it's like you said, it's a souvenir from the islands, and mm -hmm. there's probably a zillion of these. All right, moving on to customer service. Talk about your most interesting customer interactions from the last week. Uh I have an update on my cookbook uh saga or from a couple weeks ago. I said I shipped someone asked me to change the address of a cookbook that yeah. was being mailed to them. I forgot to send it to the wrong address. It actually worked out. The person got my, my mailing address, slapped it on the package when it arrived and mailed it off. And the customer in, that was in Pennsylvania. And the customer in Nashville said she got it. She loved it. She gave me awesome a good feedback. She said, uh, there was a glitch at first, but they went above and beyond to make sure I received my book. Thank you again for having a great buying experience. I would highly recommend this seller. Book was as described and in great condition. So it made me feel good. That was great. Yeah. I have another one, but I'll let you, do you have any customer interactions? This Nothing week? specific, but I've been getting a ton of um, positive feedback. Um, just saying the same thing. Great packaging, fast shipping, uh, packaged securely, you know, just a, just a ton of stuff like that. And I'm like, okay, well, that's, that's phenomenal because I, I, I do spend, you know, a little bit of extra time making sure I do a lot of breakables. Yeah. So, um, I sent out a Mackenzie Childs, you know who that is? Designer. No. It's, she makes, it's a certain pattern. If you see like a checkerboard on like a T cup or that's like her signature thing anyway I sent out a candlestick and it and the person was like blown away by how i wrapped it in bubble wrap and secured it with the you know void fill and all that stuff mm -hmm. and she's like i got it just wanted to let you know it arrived safely i love it thank you so much so you know guys if you're listening and you're and you're sending out breakables just take that extra like two seconds to make sure you know is this thing gonna make it Mm -hmm. It's going to save you a, a headache. It, it really will. And it'll make your buyer happy. And then you'll start seeing that little green thing saying repeat buyer. Mm -hmm. There's nothing more uh, enjoyable than seeing, oh, I've sold to this person before and they're coming back to my store to buy more stuff. That's what you want. So that was it. Just just some really nice comments, some nice feedback. I'm up to mm -hmm. almost 6,500 feedback. So I'm like, wow, keep going. Yeah. I said last um, week I was at 1,500, but actually I'm over 2,000. I wasn't. I'm kind of out of it. When I, don't, I don't look at my feedback enough, I guess. I just look for negatives. Um, I mean, my, if you're asking how, uh, my secret is I just, when I shoot them out, the, 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 the item, and I do all my shipping Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays, after I'm done on like today, I sent out all of my orders. I go right over and I just send all the feedback. There's a way to do That's that automatically it. though, right? You can set eBay to after... As soon as you receive payment, you can send them a, a positive feedback. But I, I wouldn't want to do that. Oh, just because, not that. No. I want to be able I, to send it out yeah. in case they cancel. You know, I want to print that yeah. label out, slap it on there, and then, I, right. then I'll then i send them. Mm -hmm. That's just It just works for me. So I don't yeah. know. I'm sure there's a thousand other different ways to do it. But anyway. Yeah, I give the positive feedback as soon as it shows arrived at the destiny or delivered. Then I okay. usually go out and do it just because I want to make sure that it gets there. My other one was I sold a DVD and about 10 minutes later, I got a message saying, hello, I just purchased this. And two seconds later, I had to click cancel. Sorry. I buy a lot of hockey movies and I placed a bid on this one. But after five days, I forgot. I didn't know your offers 
I, I, I don't know. Maybe they put it in their cart. Uh, when I paid for yours, I thought I had lost the bid, but it popped up two seconds later saying that I auto paid. So now I paid for two copies in less than a minute. I can't figure out eBay. I never mm -hmm. agreed to auto pay, but since I was forced to pay for that copy, I don't need, I, I want to cancel. Uh, is that because I have a setting, maybe forcing someone to pay, uh, pay automatically if they um, accept an offer? I don't think some of their details are right in what they said. Yeah. I don't know what five days mean. Right. But I'm like, no. if it's the, the auto pay, make them pay immediately. I want to shut that off because this is happening weekly. Somebody yeah. clicks it. They, I think someone thinks they're like adding it to their cart or they're getting ready to buy, but they don't want to pay right away. And if they want to buy multiple items from you, you don't want them to pay right away. Anyhow. Right. I have on mine. It'll say, I forget where it is. It's, it is in the settings somewhere mm -hmm. and it'll say require immediate payment and mine's off somewhere down the line. I heard that kind of, that's what you want. And mm -hmm. I've never changed it back. Now, if they, if you send him an offer and he, and he accepts it, but doesn't pay right away, I think that's the new thing that eBay's doing so that other people interested can, can buy it. Yeah. I know there's something like that going on too, but. But if I don't like he sends pay. you an offer and you accept, accept, I think he has to pay right away. Well, maybe that's what happened. Because I think that I think that's what it is. Right. You send him an offer, he accepts it, bam. No, no. He sends you an offer and you accept it, he has to pay right away. Okay. But the other no way matter. around, if you send an offer to him. He doesn't have to pay right away, and eBay wants it that way, so other people can buy, can still buy it. Yeah. Let let, let us know in the comments. I do I have it right? Do I have it backwards? It's something pretty recent that eBay has been messing with, and it's yeah. a little confusing for a buyer. They're saying, "Oh, hold on, I accepted the offer, but somebody else bought it." It's almost like uh, the Wild mm -hmm. West again. Mm -hmm. So let us know in the comments. Just a couple of days ago, someone bought a sixty dollar television from me. And then they said that they didn't even realize it was instantly charging them and they wanted to cancel like within five minutes later. Wow. So I think I sent them an offer and they accepted, but I don't think they yeah. were well, for whatever reason, they didn't want to pay right away. And then, so I relisted it and it sold the same day to a different person, same price. Now here's another situation. I know we're still, I'm going to still be on customer service here is someone from Puerto Rico bought two light bulbs from me. They're like a, an led light bulb. Uh, like 400 watt LED light bulbs. I picked up a, about 35 light bulbs for $100 at a yard sale last last spring. And uh, that was like $3 each, I think is what I paid for these light bulbs. And I've been selling them at 20 to $30 each. Uh, so this wow. person bought a light bulb and then they decided they wanted to buy a second one. And they were from Puerto Rico. So I put them in one box and shipped it. But it, because it was two separate transactions, um, even though I had a quantity of two on the item, they they bought two separate purchases. So I shipped them. You didn't combine it? Well, I, I put them both in a box and then I shipped one of them. And then I copied, what I thought I did is I copied the tracking number over to the other one, which then marks it uh, as shipped. But apparently I copied the wrong tracking number oh no. uh, to, the, to the second item. And that's the one the person was watching. So they opened up and... Um, an item not received. Right. But if you, if they would click on the other item, uh, it would show that it's still in, in, it hasn't, it won't arrive till next Tuesday, but they're looking at the one that says it arrived and they, they're saying, I never got it. So they want to, they opened up an item not received. Um, yep. and then eBay tells me I have three days to respond to this. So I go out and the three things I can do is, um, I can, uh, update the tracking information, which I can't because that one shows delivered. It won't let me change yeah. it once it shows delivered. I can refund the buyer, which I'm not going to do because they haven't got it yet and they're going to get it. And then the third option is send the buyer a message. So that's what I did. I told the buyer exactly what I did. I copied the wrong one, but if they, they click on the other one and look at the tracking, it still shows on its way, right? So I did what I did needed to do. And that was on the first day. Then the second day, eBay sends me a message saying, I, I need to respond within three days. So I send the person another message saying, uh, did you get my first message? I haven't heard anything. So then eBay sends me a message the next day saying, I need to respond. 
So is, I guess this is a glitch. If it's responding by email doesn't work, my other two options, and I can't change the tracking number, the only thing I can do is give them their money back to make this go away. Because after three days, mm. I think eBay is going to give them their money back automatically because I haven't responded. But then yep. I can I can contest that if it does happen, and eBay will, I'll tell them I did respond. But I don't know if anybody else has this problem where you're responding to that with a message and eBay is not counting it as doing anything. Have you ever encountered that? No, because normally I'll update the tracking if it's something similar to that. But in your case, you can't. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll normally send them a message and then update the tracking and then kind of let it go. Um, that's normally for an item not received. Yep. And then a couple of days later, it usually shows up and it's no problem. Or the case they say, hey, I didn't get it, but it shows delivered. That's the mm -hmm. easiast one. You just update yeah. the tracking and then you're done. You're going to win mm -hmm. that case 100 times. Can you update um, the tracking if it's delivered? Yes. Yes, you can. That's the old, it shows delivered, right? And then the person's like, hey, I never got it. Yeah. And you're like, well, uh, my job is to send it from here to there. The tracking number says it shows delivered. One of those options is update the tracking. All you do is put the same tracking. Now, I don't know why they make you do it, but you put the same tracking number in and then eBay will see it and then close, the, close it in your favor saying, tracking shows the item was delivered. You're done. I'm yeah. out of it. Uh, you know, normally it'll show up a day or two later, even though it says delivered. I've seen that a ton of times. And then the the person will get it or the person will just close close the case because they got it. Um, yeah. But you can update the tracking if it shows delivered. You can still update it. I would Why eBay? eBay should be able to do all this behind the scenes without even having to yeah. get us involved. They know it shows Absolutely. delivered. If a person yeah. says not delivered, why do we have to get involved at all? This makes no sense. Right. They send yeah, me this big thing, and then all I have I have to literally just take the number, cut and paste it, put it in there, and send it. Like, well, yeah. Why? It's the exact right. same number. And then they're like, "Oh, okay, thanks. You updated the tracking. Now we can close the case." All right, let's uh, move on to time machine. Travel back to a specific year. What would you buy then to resell now? Dennis's favorite segment of the show. I love all it. Right. All right. You, oh, wait, I, why is it my favorite? You're the time travel person. This well, isn't one of your love, favorites. Uh, I love time travel movies, so I guess, yes, this should be my favorite, right. but my favorite's customer service. I never have any good ones. I don't get snarky <laughs> with people. That's probably why. <laughs> I'm traveling back to the year 1996, and I'm going to Toys R Us and all of those other little stores, uh, all the department stores that are no longer here. And I'm buying Nintendo 64. No brainer. Uh, the price in 1996 for this unit was 199.99, which was that's a, a good chunk of change. Yeah. Back in 96 for mm -hmm. a little, you know, gaming system. Um, so I'm buying them all, and I'm buying games, and I'm not going to open them up. They come in a nice little cardboard box. And if you go, if you go to eBay, and you type in n64 and then put in like a you know game or n64 games there are some of these auctions that are unbelievable there's 80 boxed uh nintendo n64 games on you know sealed and everything this went to auction and the, the guy actually charged 145 dollars shipping which is crazy to me but probably insurance uh, 67 bids on this thing, and it went for 13 grand. Wow, 13,000 um, dollars. He has another one here, and it was N64 games sealed. It looks like 24 different games went for 6,300 dollars. Uh, rare uh, N64 games, and they're all sealed, 7,800 dollars. Wow, and another one. I mean, then then you get into some of the graded ones. See, I wouldn't even have to do that because I'm buying brand new sealed games. I'm never going to open them up. It's, they're going to be mint. But yeah. in any case, these are all coming in around 9.2, 9.6 CGC, which is the grading company. 
And they're going anywhere from four thousand up to six thousand dollars. So I typed in, yeah, I just typed in N64 sealed 1996, and it brings up a Super Mario 64 N64 still in the box sealed that sold for nine thousand dollars. So that's probably the one you want to buy if, if they need that's 1996, I guess. If yeah, show it sealed. So- you just go to around to all the stores and just yeah. un, just take all of them. You buy mm-hmm. them all and leave them in the box. The best thing is if you could get a box of them, like from the manufacturer, a box of a, you yeah. know, I think t- maybe twelve games in, in a case. That'd be that'd be crazy money. I'm talking yeah. tens of thousands for that mm-hmm. thing. So I don't know. That's what I'm buying. Where's that time machine? Darn it! Because <laughs> <Yep. laughs> I want to. I want it. <laughs> When you look up like sports cards, the the best selling sports card of 1996 is the Kobe Bryant um, rookie gold refract refractor card. Uh, they sell for thousands. Um, awesome. There's a lot of them out there. I just can't believe how many. Like if it's highly rated or um, graded, uh, you know, you're you. I don't know how if you could just. I guess you could just buy them from a, like a card store, but to, you know how many packs do you have to buy to to get one in a pack, but. Um, I would just buy a lot of those up, but I am not really a big basketball fan. Not really as much as you are, for sure. Uh, Whoa. <laughs> I just looked it up. Yeah. yeah. You're not you're you not kidding. What do you see? These are insane. Absolutely insane. I've got a... Uh, well, I mean, if what is, this is a signed card for $15,000. A lot of these are like really high grades. Mm-hmm. Um yeah, 96 Kobe. It's a Tops Chrome rookie card, $8,000. Uh, that sold just a couple weeks ago. Here's one that sold. What's today? Here's one that sold today. 1996 Ultra Fresh Faces, number three. Kobe Bryant. It got a gem mint grading, 8000 <laughs> It's just it's incredible. And there's just a ton of them, rows and rows and rows of them. Anywhere from ten down to 5000 4,300. Yeah. I mean, he was highly collectible when he was alive. Wow. Which is yeah. just crazy that there's that many cards out there and yet they still hold that kind of value. Like you think the market would just be flooded with them. Right. But maybe, right, maybe right. it was limited edition or something, but anyhow, that's, that's what I would do for the money. But just for the fun of it, my son has a lot of Mario plushies. And if you type in 1996, either Nintendo plush or super Mario plush, you're going to see, a lot of plush that sell for a thousand dollars or more than between 500 to a thousand dollars. So I'm probably going to buy some plush for my son. And I'm going to say, you can look at them, put them on your shelf, but don't play with them. <laughs> of course, my son won't be born for another 15 years, but um, that's just a minor detail. Wow. I'll give him to him when he's born. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it, they're investments. This is pretty much what we're talking about. The time machine of investments you know mm-hmm. go back get some stuff to invest your money i mean when i say i'm going to go in and buy all of the n64s that's that's going to be a lot of money but i can you know a hundred times my investment even more than that maybe 200 times my investment in just a short amount of time from 96 mm-hmm. to now you know it's it's a sure well we know it's a sure thing because we're traveling from now to then yeah. But, but how much wild. would you have made in the stock market if you'd invested the same amount of money? Right. Let's say uh, I bought. Wouldn't let's say fun. about five thousand dollars worth of N sixty four games. You know, it's you know a system was two hundred, yeah. so that adds up pretty quick. You're not going to get a lot for five thousand dollars. You'd have to move up to maybe fifteen or twenty grand to drop on video games in nineteen ninety six. Yeah, I buy more games and systems probably because they take yeah. up less space. But a sealed system from that that time frame, that's that's pretty sick too. Mm-hmm. So, so moving on to uh, so you want to be a full time reseller, uh, share a tip on what it takes to go full time. What do you have? I want to talk a little bit about the importance of being consistent, consistently good, not consistently bad with bad habits and being lazy and being you know. I guess when I have time for it type of stuff, you have to be um, on a schedule, okay? 
So I know it's really hard going part-time to full-time because most of your schedule is your full-time job. But this part of this job, this full-time reselling requires you to be disciplined. It requires you to be on a schedule and it definitely requires consistency no matter what you're doing, no matter what you're sourcing, packaging, listing, taking good photos, it's all consistent. And you have to do, I mean, it's kind of mundane where you're doing the same type of actions over and over again, but that's what consistency is. And if those actions are leading to you making money, then you want to keep doing those over and over and over again. Get out of bed, go do your sourcing, go do your packaging, go to the post office, come back, take pictures, list. And you're just constantly doing, you know, what they say, uh, wash, rinse, repeat. Like that's the type of attitude that you have to have day in, day out. And um, I, I break my schedule up into days that I source, days that I ship, and a certain couple of days during the week where I take pictures for the week. And it, it seems to work. And um, you just have to be, you know, committed to having that same sort of action over and over again. And if it gets boring, then change something up. But if it's working, then keep that in your schedule. So uh, the importance of being consistent is one of the biggest things that you're going to have to learn uh, quickly when you make the jump. Yeah, it's funny that I we didn't talk about what we were each one was going to say, but I was about time management and removing distractions, especially when listing. Uh, like I said, when I was on jury duty, I I only had time to ship products. I did like you always have to ship uh, that you can't you got to get your stuff shipped or you're you're not going to be in business long. And so when distractions come along, it seems like the you get called away for something that takes away from your listing time for the most of the time. Cause you still gotta, you're still outsourcing whenever you can. And sometimes it affects that, but most of the time listing gets put on the back burner. And if you, as long as, if you have enough time in the day, you get everything else done. And then if I have time left, I'll list. That's kind of how I, I operate. When I go in in the morning each day, um, I, I pack up everything first thing that's, that goes out just in case I'd get called away. At least I got my stuff shipped that day. I put it in my car and get ready to go to the post office. I mean, it, so that when I leave, I go straight to the post office. Then I go back inside and I, I start testing and listing product. That's my typical day. But it's very easy to get off track when you're listing. Um, so it yeah. sounds like you take all your photos at one time and you list your items later. Every single night. And it's um, before dinner. It's, you know, after like my day is over, I'll, I, I have photos on my phone ready to go and I will list 15 items and then probably a few on Poshmark. And that's every single day. Like there are no days off. There are no, I don't feel like it. It's, I got to get my listings done. Yeah. So I guess another word we could use in this is prioritize. You, you have to have some priorities in this. Um, you know, your big pile of stuff is not going to sell if you're not going to take pictures of it and list it. So a priority has to be listing, more yeah. listings. Uh, you yeah. hear it all the time from all the other YouTubers and, and podcasters, you know, list more. Are you having slow sales? List more. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it makes sense. <laughs> the more items that you have in your store, you're going to make more sales. Um, but it's, it's a huge priority for me to list every single day. I, I'll even list, you know, sometimes on vacation. <laughs> I'll do, uh, I'll just do five, you know, daily and, and, it won't, won't take that much just to keep the activity going. Yeah. Um, are they in your draft bank when you go on vacation or you just have photos? Just photos. Just photos. And then I do sell similar. So you've never create, you haven't created the ad yet. You just have a bunch of photos in your phone. Yeah. So how do you know like where you put the item in your warehouse? Because when I list something, I always, I go figure out where I'm going to put it in my warehouse. And then I add that location to the, the SKU. So, well, I know that there's there's shelves of certain item on it. There is a toy shelf. There is a matchbox Hot Wheels shelf. There is a, you know, glassware. There is just, I don't know. It just keeps my mind fresh because I know where everything is at any given time. And you're talking like 1,200 items. So you don't use the SKU system or you do? No. Nope. Not at all? I do not. You ship the wrong item ever because uh, two items were similar in the same location? No. 
I don't like to put like items in the same place because then I don't ever get them mixed like up. This would yeah. drive you crazy. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah, it'd take me forever to find the DVD, but I have boxes and, and tubs all over and shelving. And so when I go to that tub and there's not going to be 50 CDs in that tub, there's going to be maybe five that I have to choose from. So I, I, I like doing it that way. I should do a, um, I should do a video on pulling orders to kind of show our viewers like how yeah. I do it. And then maybe you can do something similar. Do you remember a couple of weeks ago, I shared a story about the speakers that I shipped to the guy and then he, yep. they were damaged. So he shipped them back and I had $400 in the shipping in, in addition to the price that I paid for them, which was $200. So my goal mm -hmm. was just to get my money back. So the other day I, I sat and as I was watching TV in, in the evening, I was on um, Terra Peak trying to figure out if I took these speakers completely apart, how much money could I get for all the individual components? And I have calculated that I could sell off everything but the cabinets themselves and get $850. Yes. And I'm like, That's why amazing. didn't I just do that to begin with? <laughs> I could have saved myself $400 that was wasted in yep. shipping. So I tore those things apart over the last like two days ago and I, and I'm rebuilding the woofer. I, I rebuilt one of them today. I'm going to rebuild the other one next week and get those up. Cause they'll sell for like $300 for the pair. It's amazing. If they're, if they're fixed. So I've been going through a lot of old speakers at, you know, the, the company advent. Yep. I have some of their series series speakers from the 1980s, seventies and eighties. And I've been tearing those apart. Uh, if you have a, a really nice pair of those that are restored, you're talking two to three thousand yeah. dollars. I'm like, this is crazy. I have the speakers complete, but the cabinets have some wood damage, and all the speakers need to be rebuilt. So I put one up on auction, started it at two hundred dollars, and I, I, I wanted to see what it would bring, and I forgot that I left best offers on, and like instantly someone offered me two hundred eighty dollars, and I said, yeah, that might be higher than it ends, but I want to see where this is going to go. I'm not going to take your offer. Sorry. And then I listed another one the next day, a different, uh, a different model. That's a little more collectible. I started that at three fifty. and I just want to see where it goes. So I paid wow. $5 each for these speakers, $5 each. And because uh, the cabinets looked bad or whatever, yeah, right? Yep. The, the speakers yeah. were all bad. So people want to rebuild those. They're highly desirable. Parts. U.S. made, right? Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. I can't believe how collectible they actually are. But that, I just wanted to give a little update on on the speakers that had I just parted them out to begin with and thrown the cabinets away, I would have been so much better off. Yep. And no shipping, big giant speakers. Right. I'm not doing that anymore. If I ship it something giant, it's going to be the empty cabinet. I'm not going to have any right. speak, nothing inside it that can break. Well, my uh, my. My speaker update um, story is I won my case. Remember those in ceiling speakers? Yeah. Crappy brand. And he said they got there damaged. This was through um, FedEx. And there was like no problem. I just sent them the photos of it. And I got a check for $81.70 or whatever. Oh, nice. Yeah. So I'm and like, he awesome. Did he keep them or did you ship them back? No, he kept them. Okay. Wow. He could probably use them. The grills were kind of messed up, but I wasn't going to have him send them back for, I think it was like 20 something dollars to ship. Yeah. I'm like, Nope, I'm good. But I got my money anyway. So. Yeah. I have a golf club story that's similar to that. I was going to share it today actually, but I'd say we're running out of time. We're running a little long here, so I'll save it for another day. We still got to talk about how Dennis gets his free stuff. That's on my list. We just never get to it folks. We just have so much other good content to get to first. Got to keep uh, listening. Yeah. Maybe next week. Uh, this is our final segment of the day is question of the week. Uh, we try to come up with a question based on the conversations we had today. So what do we come up with, Dennis? Well, we talked about your great experience in jury duty. So I'd like to throw that back out to our viewers. Um, let's say you are uh, assigned to a jury and that, that it's going to last for two weeks. What are some of the preparations that you would take to make sure that you're your sales are, are still somewhat relevant because you're going to be gone for two weeks. Um, you know, do you go to vacation mode? Do you leave the store open? 
Do you try to burn the candle at both ends? How would you handle that situation? Yeah, let us know in the comments. Um, we like to hear from you. So get creative if you want to. Have fun with it. Whatever. Get snarky. Get you snarky know, with we us. We love it. We've reached the end of episode six. Episode six. Wow. And uh, you have any closing thoughts for us? I just want to thank you guys for hanging out with us. And um, I love the comments. I love the thumbs up. If you like the the content, if you enjoyed yourself, if if you found something that we you know spoke about um, was relative relevant and um, entertaining, maybe uh, did you get something out of this? Give us a, a subscribe and a thumbs up, and we will see you next week. All right, we'll see you later, everyone. Have a good day. Have a good week, I guess. Have a good week, everyone. Yeah.